Right, next up, uh, some more on exercise, and this time from Sam Barnard. Uh, Sam is a pediatric diabetes uh, specialist nurse. He's working at Calderdale and Huddersfield Trust. He has been a nurse specialist for six years, something he wanted to specialize in since becoming a nurse eight years ago. He's also lived with type 1 diabetes for 19 years, right? He's also one of the healthcare professionals in the Diabetes 101 group that we set up. He's an exercise enthusiast. He competes in strongman events across the UK plays rugby union and a fabulous friend to many, many in Team uh, you know, Diabetes UK. So without further ado, Sam, please, over to you. Do take it away. Uh, so my name's Sam. I'm one of the uh, Paediatric Diabetes Specialist Nurses from Calderdale and Huddersfield Trust. Um, and today I'm just going to be talking about sports exercise and diabetes. So when I was asked to, to do this talk, I was asked to do it as someone with type 1 diabetes and, and not a nurse um, and so what you can see on the screen there is a person that has tried all these sports and things um, and has failed at managing the, the blood glucose levels um, but has just managed to get through it anyway. So uh, I've had diabetes for about 19 years, um, I've been a DSN for about 6 years now, uh, I'm married, I've got a 9 week old little boy and a three, week, three year old little boy as well. Um, which I totally class uh, parenting as, as exercise in itself. Um, so my day-to-day -day exercise consists of taking the lads out for a walk, doing some running and going to the gym. Um, but my competition history is, is in strongman. Um, but like a lot of us, uh, life for me often gets in the way of, of exercising. So when things are really, really busy, I tend to kind of lower the expectations of myself and just aim for a, um, an increased step count. Um, I'm someone that, that absolutely loves diabetes technology, but I think in, in the role that I do with work as well, we um, it's really important that we understand that technology isn't always the answer. Uh, and for a lot of people, it can increase the difficulty of, of keeping on top of diabetes. So I just wanted to, to kind of briefly outline my journey in, in diabetes as well. Um, and I, I really enjoyed putting this slide together. It kind of reminded me of all the all the tech and how much things have advanced. Um, so I started with mixed insulin, and I remember going to the DSN, uh, going to the consultant, and asking for the newest, the smallest, the the best looking glucose meters. A couple of years on, it was shinier meters, shinier pens. And um, a few years after that, I was uh, put onto a, a paradigm pump, which was fantastic. Uh, and then fast forward about six years later, upgraded to a, a Roche combo, which was fantastic because while I was at university, or, or certainly for the first couple of months, I didn't want anyone to know I had diabetes. I was trying to try my best to, to hide it away and, and uh, for, not, for no one to, to see it really. So the Roche combo with the, the bolus function, remote bolusing helped me a lot. Um, Another few years passed and um, I had met my, my, my now wife, uh, and I was having a lot of overnight hypos um, and I couldn't seem to kick them. So I met with the consultant um, and they agreed that I could start on, on CGM. The hypos didn't didn't stop with the CGM and when my wife was working on nights, uh, I still wasn't waking to the alarms. So um, my blood sugar was getting dangerously low, um, which was a bit worrying. So I, I was then moved on to uh, sensor augmented pump to the 640. Um, and then I've luckily enough been able to upgrade again to the to the 780, which has been fantastic. So since becoming a, a DSN, uh, I've had the opportunity to do lots of research to use technologies to support children and young people uh, in our service, um, which means I've, I've been lucky, lucky enough to, to try all this tech. Uh, so I like to try all the pumps, all the CGMs, everything before we start rolling them out to people. So that's enough about me, more on to kind of what I'm, I'm here to talk about. So the most important thing for sports and exercise is to look at the three types of exercise and how they're going to affect your glucose level. So to start with, we've got anaerobic exercise. So anaerobic exercises are things like weightlifting, sprinting, high intensity exercises. So that's anything that you're going to use a large amount of energy over a really short period of time. And that quite simply is going to push your blood sugar up because it sparks that fight and flight response in your body. Aerobic exercises, things like walking, jogging, swimming, uh, 
exercises that are over a longer period of time, but use a lower amount of energy, and they're going to lower your glucose level. And mixed exercises, which is generally your your ball sports, rugby, football, um, sports where you're going to be doing a little bit of anaerobic and a little bit of aerobic. And these can push your blood sugars up, down, left, right. Um, so I always like to in include this in when we're talking about sports and exercise, because it's a really simple, easy picture that kind of depicts where your blood sugar is going to go with what type of exercise as well. So before doing any exercise, uh, for me, I've, I've generally worked out the answer to the questions that are on the screen. And when I say worked out, I mean, I've kind of took a, a gamble and, and hoped it paid off because it's that's kind of what a lot of us do with, with type 1 diabetes. So understanding how the types of exercise affect your blood glucose plays really nicely into answering these questions. And all you're basically trying to do is preempt what your blood glucose is going to do and stop it from doing that with either insulin, carbs or exercise. So managing blood glucose during exercise with insulin all requires some advanced decision making, which is really, really difficult if you live a busy lifestyle. Um, so if you're doing planned exercise and you're having a meal within two hours, you can consider reducing the bolus by about 50%. The reason we do this is because exercise turbocharges insulin, so it makes your insulin super, super efficient, so potentially causing you to have the low glucose level while you're exercising. If you're exercising later in the day, then consider reducing your basal rate and beginning with about 20%. For those people that are on pump therapy, utilizing the temporary basal rate can be a real game changer for managing sports and exercise. For those on closed loop systems that can't... The, these closed loop systems can't always uh, stop the low glucose from happening with sports and exercise because you've got something that's dragging the glucose level down quite quickly. Um, so one of the things that you can do with those is increasing the temp targets just to reduce the chances of you dropping lower. Bolus in post-exercise uh, can also be reduced by about 50%. That can just stop you from having the hypo later on as well. And that's specifically important with anaerobic exercise because that's going to bring your glucose down later instead of earlier. It's really, really handy to be looking at your CGM or your Libra data uh, so that you can see what happened during the exercise and at what points your glucose level rose and dropped. And that can help you with deciding how much insulin to have before and after. The next one is managing blood glucose uh, with carbohydrates. So uh, again, well, this isn't really the one that I would choose to do. Um, in some instances where you're doing exercise and it's been a bit off the cuff and it, you haven't had time to prep for it, and carbohydrates can be used. So if your blood glucose is less than four, then you're going to need some carbohydrates to fuel your body to stop your glucose going low. You So one of the factors for exercise over a longer period of time is ensuring that your body has enough carbohydrates to fuel the exercise that you're doing. So if you're someone who needs about 60 grams per hour of exercise carbohydrates, then having 20 grams every 20 minutes instead of 60 grams in one big lump um, can be easier for your body to handle and easier on the blood sugars can cause that cause less of a spike. Uh, for recovery, so if it's more than, if it's less than 60 minutes or 30 minutes of high intensity, then about 30 to 50 grams of carbohydrates and then adding in some protein into that snack or meal as well. Ensuring that you've got the, the recovery carbohydrates because despite the diabetes, you still need some carbohydrates to recover from as well. If you're exercising towards the evening, by the time the exercise, you've recovered from the initial spike or drop of the exercise itself you may need some carbohydrates and some protein before you go to bed to stop your glucose level going going low overnight the effects of exercise can bring glucose levels down for the next 24 hours and again looking at the blood glucose the cgm your, your libra trends to work out at what points things have dropped or risen and how you can manage that going forward uh, it's just a handy screen on there, so it, it's uh, the amount of exercise, uh, the, the amount of carbohydrates, sorry, that you would need um, per time of exercise, 
and things that you you might want to take so you generally want um high glycemic index foods so sweets juices um stuff that's going to get glucose into your body quickly so this is the one that I, I want to talk a little bit more about so for me uh, the exercise that i do which is kind of gym work or um walking running um this tends to be the easiest one to to use for the majority of time so managing blood glucose with exercise during exercise all starts with the blood glucose level that you've got to begin with so if you've got a slightly raised glucose level we're going to go the right way around so if you've got a slightly raised glucose level you could start with an exercise that's going to lower your glucose level so we know aerobic exercise lowers glucose so if you start with a, an aerobic exercise as your blood glucose level drops you can then switch to an anaerobic exercise so a really really good example of that is um if you're going to go out for a jog or a little run if you can scan or if you can check your cgm and you can see your blood glucose level dropping and you're worried it's going to carry on dropping then two 10 second sprints should increase your blood glucose level by about three to four millimoles so that's a really really handy tool to have if you're someone that drops quite low after exercise or after a run then if you're running home those two 10 second sprints could potentially stop you from having that hypo and needing to treat if we go back to the start if you're starting with a blood glucose level that is within range and you're concerned about dropping if you're going to do some aerobic exercise then start with anaerobic exercise because we know anaerobic exercise increases the blood glucose level as the blood glucose level drop rises you can then switch to an aerobic exercise that is going to then bring the glucose level back down so this is one of the handy tools that that i use um i have a, a little book that has a gym session a log for the morning gym session log for the evening um a rugby session a strong a, a strength session and i would log what time I started, uh, what I've done beforehand, what insulin changes or what what's, what reduction I've done, and then try and look for patterns. If you have one log that you use all the time for all the different sessions, then you're, you're going to struggle to find the patterns in each session. Because, uh, say for example, a training session at football or rugby is going to have a completely different effect on your blood glucose level than a training session at uh, the gym or somewhere else so break them down into certain activities and then go from there so when using continuous glucose monitoring uh, during exercise it's it's really important to be able to review your own data um, and in my opinion that's what the diabetes teams are there for they're to their they're there to support you um, and educate you in ways that you want to be educated so if you're struggling to look at your own data or get downloaded then the diabetes teams are, are the one to contact um, when you look at your data, try and explore the reasons for the high and low blood glucose levels um, and try and make changes based on what's, what's happening using either insulin, carbohydrates or exercise itself. If you're struggling to find the cause for the hypos, it's worth checking the carb, carb counting that you're doing, reweighing portions if you need to, um, and just making sure that your ratios aren't the reason why you're having highs and lows during the exercise later on or beforehand. Um, it should be encouraged for anyone that has uh, anyone that is doing lots of exercise or anyone that's struggling to check through our exercise that we're using Libra and CGM too. Those people that have got hyper one awareness using flash and uh, continuous glucose monitoring is super important around exercise because it makes it really really easy for you to check if you're going low as well. So the the biggest help for me as someone that's done a lot of sports and exercise um, in, in different manners it is making sure that we're recording the carbohydrates we've done, uh, the insulin that we've given, the type of exercise that we've done and being able to find the pattern in those exercises. Um, and, and like I said, there's no point logging it all on the same log. You need to have different logs for different exercises that you're doing. There's a little bit on the screen there that's just about signposting for different places. Um, I, I can tweak that out at a later date, um, but there's loads of handy resources on there as well about sports and exercise. Thank you.
Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Fantastic. Lovely hints, tips there as ever. Uh, not always uh, easy to exercise what works. You know, one day may work, one day may not. So it's good. So good to know. Good to have those tips. So it's nearly time for a lunch break, but just a few comments because, you know, thank you very much for all the comments that are keeping on coming. With the pregnancy session, I just wanted to mention quite rightly, somebody has said is that I think we need to be very careful also as clinicians about the language we use. And, you know, you might know my views on the language matters issues and stuff. Uh, it's, it's simple things like just because you have a big baby doesn't mean that your diabetes control is poor. Uh, sometimes it could be genetic. Sometimes it could be what we call high drops due to, you know, collection of fluid being of the skin and all that. But so we need to be careful about the language we use in that focus. There's also quite a lot of questions about closed loops. Bring it to the Q&A session. We'll try and answer that as much as possible there. I understand the issues about, uh, you know, what we have around uh, looping, etc. So it's 12.35 or thereabouts, or we should have a lunch break, slightly shorter, so we keep it to time. Let's come back at 1.10 as we 35 minutes get some food, etc. But while you're there, get a, grab your food. There's some kind sponsors of the event today, Dexcom, Abbott, Insulet. So grab a bite, sit down, have a look at these videos. As some, as a lot of you have said, technology and the information is very important. So you maybe you will you'll find it helpful. If you do know, well, you know, who knows, you might pick up a tip. So grab some food. We'll see you back again. 110. We'll see you then and we'll continue the day. Till then.